Welcome everyone to the webinar brought to you by the International College of Prostodontists. It's our pleasure to present to you Finlay Sutton, a world expert in removable prostodontists. He will talk about giving our patients superb immediate dentures. Dr. Sutton is from Northwest England. And I'm Limo Vivi Albert. I'm a prostodontist from the Faculty of Dentistry in Toronto, Canada. I'm a member of the ICP Board of Consular. Today, our panelist is uh, Professor Ami Schmidt uh, from the Department of Prostodontics at the Hebrew University Hadassah School of Dental Medicine in Jerusalem, Israel. He is also a member of the ICP Board of Consulars, and he is the chair of Professional Relation Committee of the International College of Prostodontists. That's good. So, uh, thank you very much, um, Limo and Tammy. It's fantastic. I'm really excited to be here today to speak to you. Uh, I'm talking about immediate dentures. <laughs> and I think they're really difficult to do. They're challenging. I want to share with you Bonner. So, first of all, to show you her case very quickly. So, Donna presented to me, she's in her mid 40s. She's healthy, fit, and like, she loves life, but she's really embarrassed about her teeth. She absolutely hates doing the school run, and she's embarrassed about it, dropping her boy off at school when she came to see me. She's got periodontally involved teeth that started to drip. So let's have a look at the x-ray picture now. So she's got generalised periodontitis, which is stage four. This is the new classification, very severe. It's grade C and it's progressing rapidly. Let's superimpose the bone levels on the on here, on her teeth. You can see in the maxilla, there's virtually no bone holding these teeth in, very little left. And also, those lower anteriors too are in really poor condition. So, I really had to work out which ones we're going to try to keep. So, and I felt that all of the upper teeth had hopeless prognosis. And these lower core incisors, hopeless prognosis, and also the back lower right molar too. So that's what we decided to do. And so this was the initial first phase of treatment was to provide Donna with a full upper denture, immediate, and and then do a lower acrylic based denture and also do periodontal therapy. Uh, I think there is a, a noise on the on the line. There's noise on the line, Ami. Should I try headphones and see if that helps? Can you hear me okay? Oh, now it's better. Is that better? Yeah, good. Okay, so this is what we decided to do. This was the stabilization phase. So, and let's move on. Now, I didn't see Donna for 18 months. And so this was the situation 18 months later. And by this stage, the upper right central incisor had dropped out, had exfoliated as well as that lower right central incisor and she'd made a decision she wanted to have treatments now because she'd saved up enough money to have it done and also because of the, the teeth dropping out she knew she just needed to go ahead to have treatment so so my job is to give Rowan some superb impressions so these are the impressions that I gave Rowan here for um, for Donna. Just one second, uh, Limo and Ami, how is the sound for you? 
Is it okay? Can you hear me? Now it's better. That's now good. It's better. Now it's better. When uh, there's some kind of noise on the line, I don't know where it comes from. That's fine. So I've got a comfort a monitor here, which has told me that the, the sounds okay. That's great. So I've got to give Rowan some really superb impressions, and then he can then pour these and make the dentures on. Um, I want to share with you the material that I use here. So if we look at it here, for the base material, I use Tropicalgin, um, which goes into the tray, and I inject some material into the sulcus, which is on the right hand side, which is neocolloid. So, but first of all, before, before doing the impression, I've got to check which teeth are wobbly and which ones may actually be pulled out in the impression. So I work my way around the mouth and pull on the teeth and just feel them before I do the impression. And in Donna's case, I actually having felt them, I knew that they wouldn't come out. Although they've got massive amounts of attachment loss, I knew that with alginate, they're not going to pull out. But I'm going to share with you some other techniques if we've got really wobbly teeth that will come out in the impression. And I'll share that with you in a minute. But let's go to Donna now. So this is what I would do for Donna. So here we are. So this is the surgery here. So Claire here, my dental nurse, is going to mix and put the injectable material into this bowl and mix that up and then she'll load it into that large monoject syringe. I'm mixing at the same time, I'm mixing at the same time just there and I just want to, I'm going to load up the tray. So I load the tray and I'm thinking what, how much material do I need to put in the tray so that it's going to go into the sulcus? I just want to know that it's going to go in the right place. So I load that myself. Claire loads the, the other syringe with the alginate. So this is an alginate material. And then once I've loaded the tray, I get some water on my gloved hand so I and glaze it so I glaze it with water and then I go to the mouth and do the impression so Claire just pulls the lip forward and then I can then do the impression so let's actually go and have a look at Donna herself so this is Donna in the chair and Claire's got these little retractors. These little retractors, I learnt, um, I've actually first saw these from Dr. Abe in Japan, and they're just wonderful for lifting the lip forward so I can actually see where I'm going to do the impression. So I've got Donna sitting up, and I'm gonna inject it right into the sulcus, all the way around. So this is the injectable version all the way around the sulcus and I can see exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to then change it. Now I'm going to just pick up the base material in my stock tray, which is loaded and glazed. I take this to the mouth, rotate it in, and I'm talking to the patient throughout this whole process and just helping her get through it. You know, breathe through your nose, hypnotic voice, push that tray up. I seat it at the back first, and then I push it up, and then I coax the impression material to fill the sulcus fully, and just pushing that material up into the sulcus, and constantly saying to the patient, Breathe through your nose, beautiful, hypnotic and calming. And then I have a stopwatch and it tells me when it's set. 
and I can say, and then I can take it out. So here we are taking it out. Now, Donna is going to be slightly scared about this and nervous about this coming out because she may feel the teeth might come out with the impression. Now, look at Claire's hand. Claire's hand is on her shoulder, comforting her. That's like an automatic thing that Claire does, is looks after the patient through this horrible experience. Because she's going to be worried about those teeth coming out. And what I'm trying to do is, what I'm thinking is, trying to pull that impression tray down the vertical axis of, of these teeth. So, and that's what, these are the impressions that I, these were the actual impressions you've just seen me doing the video for, that I took for Donna. And this is absolutely the key to success with dentures, with prosthodontics in general, superb impressions are key. Now, people often ask me, what do we do in circumstances when we've got really wobbly teeth? where the teeth are so wobbly, if we do an impression, it's gonna pull them out. In the impression, even in alginate, it will pull them out. This is what I do if we've got a few teeth that are quite wobbly. I get some Futar D, and it's a bite registration material made by Kattenbach, a German product. I squirt it in between, into the embrasures of the teeth, and then mold it just with a gloved finger with some Vaseline on and let it set. And then I can comfortably do an impression over that without pulling the teeth out. And actually often with these, you can see in this impression in this area here, there that I'm highlighting, that is the Futar D block out material and we can actually glue it back into the impression as well so that avoids us pulling the teeth out that's one method that I use and I'm going to share with you another method later on if we've got loads of wobbly teeth but let's go back to Donna so at Donna's visit one when I do the impressions I also need to take a bite registration so and this is a bite done with Futar D bite registration material. It's the same stuff as I use for blocking out. And I've recorded this in maximum intercuspation. So ICP position, not center relation. If I'm making a definitive denture further on down the line, I use CR, I use center relation but not at this point. And this is what Rowan did for her. He, he arranged the teeth. This is a, a full upper denture, arranged just like a natural teeth. She had missing lateral incisors and the canines that come forward. So we brought those forward and all we're trying to do is to put them back where they were naturally. And when we come and have a look at her, her smile here, if we have a look further on, next slide here, Donna wanted that smile on the right hand side back. And you can see clearly that the lateral incisors are missing from that, but all of the teeth are quite nicely aligned. So if I now move forward to what we did for her, this is how it all ends up. In other words, we've just done orthodontics for her, but with a denture and just taking everything back. And it's just wonderful. I love doing this type of work. And this is why I think um, this branch of dentistry is so rewarding because it does change people's lives overnight. And so this is, this is Donna one week after having all of the teeth out and having this denture fitted and it really did change her life and it meant that she could do the school run and socialize and talk to other people and she got a new job it's just really amazing and it's just a denture so 
Now, I want to move on now to the process of making the denture as comfortable as possible straight after extracting the teeth. So if we have a patient like this here, where we've just taken the teeth out, they are they're the extraction sockets here. So what I do is this. I inside the immediate denture, once I've extracted the teeth, inside the immediate denture, I put a light bodied silicone wash material, just like we'd use for a crown and bridge impression. So that goes into the fitting surface of the denture with, without any adhesive on. This is to fit check. I take this to the mouth and try it in. So I push that down. So this is the patient still numb. They've got the local anesthetic in place. Seat the denture fully onto the maxilla. Give it a wiggle, do some border moulding, but push it down firmly. And then I take it out. And then I look at this here. And if you look closely on the fitting surface, it's rubbed off, the silicone's rubbed off here a lot. And it's also rubbed off here on the side. Now, these are classic areas for immediate dentures to be really sore. So I ignore the fact that we've come pushed through to the palate here because the palate, I want the denture to sit firmly on the palate because that's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to be resorbed. That's support for us. But in these two areas here, I take a pencil and draw on that area where you can see that there's, it's rubbed away. It's a fit check visit appointment, really, this fit check procedure. And then draw on here. And then what I do is I peel off the silicone like this. And it shows here and here. This is where it's rubbed off. And then I take a tungsten carbide burr and I drill those areas away. I grind off about half a millimeter and then I check it again and I keep doing it until it's fine, until we've got some nice even layer of silicone on and this helps with reducing post-operative discomfort massively. So another top tip at the review visits, uh, so if we now fast forward one week and we have the patient back in, then if there's rubbing and ulceration on the ridge above there, then what I do is I, I identify where that ulcer is, I dry it with the gauze, I use some pressure indicator paste, some PIP, onto the ulcer directly, and then taking the dry denture, push that in and take it out. And that is so precise at picking up ulcers and exactly where it's rubbing. So in that position here, there, I then take my tungsten carbide and drill it away. So, and that's a great tip, it's lovely. This is my dental technician, Rowan. I've worked with Rowan for the past 20 years and we have grown together over that time. And we, he, we can't do what we do as prosthodontists. I'm speaking to the converted here with the, through the ICP here. Technicians are vital to what we're doing. And I've also just recently um, recruited another superb technician, Sam, who's working with Rowan um, two days a week and he's been with us for six, six months. Technicians are absolutely dead important and all of the work you'll see today is Rowan stuff. 
fantastic. Also, within the presentation today, I've, if you go to my website and click on speaking, the PDF copy of today's presentation is in there. And if you scroll down that page, you go down the page and you'll find, I've circled it in red here, how to give your patients superb immediate dentures. The whole of this presentation is on my website and you can just download that there. There's also lots of other resources on here, useful information like papers that I've written, construction manual. These three papers I wrote with John Bessford and they are full of fantastic information. This is John Bessford, my mentor, who is an amazing uh, removable prosthodontist. So now I want to move on to another more extreme case here. So here's Joe. Now, I was going to, with Joe, take all of his upper teeth out, they're all shot, and then two lower teeth out. So a full upper and a lower partial. Now, but doing an impression like I did do for Donna would mean I'd pull out lots of teeth. So I want to share with you how I get around it when we've got loads of teeth that need to come out. So I need to record all of this here beautifully. So I've got to build an impression and I build it using an impression tray like this with compound in the middle. This is red cake compound. So and I cut away the periphery of the tray here. So that labial bit I cut off. And you can see it here. In, I'm just about to put it into Joe's mouth here. So I rotate this in. Gently rotate it in, sit it up at the back, and then push it up. So this is part one of this impression. So part two, what I do is I load the tray with alginate. So it's got the compound in here. I load it with um, dense ply blueprint alginate. And then I then take that to the mouth like this. So this is part two of part of, of a three step impression making process. And I'm thinking about these really wobbly teeth. I don't want the impression material to go around those wobbly teeth and pull them out. I just want it to sit on the occlusal surfaces and on the palate. And I just gently push it down round the edge there. And then wait for it to set. I have my timer going and I get him to waggle his jaw, coronoid process, doing some border moulding and then take it out. So this is what it looks like in the mouth before I take it out here. And then I gently take it out just by holding the teeth and just wiggling it down and I, I cut some little grooves here, so there's a little groove there and a little groove there, and then I reseat this back into the mouth like that. So I push it back in. Those grooves help this third step. So I put it back into the mouth, hold it in place, and with a heavy bodied silicone impression material, I squirt that into the sulcus. So I'm going to fill up the sulcus with this heavy bodied, this is a Shotlander product, it's a heavy bodied silicone impression material, squirt it into the sulcus all the way round the periphery like that and then mould it so it just feeds up into the sulcus beautifully just there and then once it's set I take it out really carefully so here we go I've got to take out the, the first part of the impression, the alginate, gently out and then gently take out the second bit, just lifting it off and away. I've just got a wax knife there just to lift the whole thing away. And so that all comes out like this. So we get two bits like this. 
So we get two parts, and then Rowan sticks it together with super glue. So we use super glue just to lock it in, just like a jigsaw, and that produces a beautiful impression, occlusal surfaces, but also a beautiful impression of the sulky with that um, silicone impression material. And then here we've got the cast. This is the cast that we're going to make the definitive, the um, immediate denture on. So that gets mounted using our intercuspal record, ICP record, and then we take the teeth off and Rowan makes a denture there, makes it beautifully. This is the immediate denture. This immediate denture is going to be worn for nine to 12 months. So that's the upper complete and lower partial for Joe. On the lower partial, we've got these wrought wire 0.9 millimeter stainless steel clasps. They're beautiful, they're, they're embedded into the acrylic and they hold the denture in place beautifully. So let's now move forward to Joe's extraction visit. So I'm gonna take all of his teeth out there at the top and then these two premolars at the bottom. It's not a nice visit. Now, at this visit, I do a visco gel reline. And I do this in about 60% of the cases that I do for immediate dentures. So, a visco gel reline is just to fill in the gap where we've had to take off the teeth from the model and there'll be a void between there. So Viscogel is terrific. Now, the issue is when I put Viscogel in the mouth like this, it runs over and embeds itself into the embrasures of the teeth here like that. And so, and it takes ages to clean it up. So this is what I do. I put a layer of wax on the labial surface, just one layer of wax all the way around and keep it free of the periphery so that the visca gel can roll onto that area and form a nice border, but it's avoiding getting it, all of that stuff into these interdental embrasures. It is just such a good tip and it helps us to clean it up quickly afterwards. So the visca gel, I mix it up nice and thick like this, load it in, We've got our wax on the periphery to stop it going into the teeth. I take this to the mouth and then mold it just like I would do for a complete denture over and over and then pulling the lips, pulling the cheek down, suck the finger, you know, so that the whole periphery, waggle the jaw, all of those movements are done. And then take that out, peel off the wax, and tidy the whole periphery up, and then it's ready, it's ready to go, it's good to go. So this is Joe at the fit visit. You know, it fits beautifully, we've got a great occlusion on it um, with visca gel there. Let's fast forward now one week. So here's Joe with his immediate denture in place. We've got some characterization of the incisal edges, little chipping. He wanted it to look like natural teeth. And we've, we've actually tilted that six out here too and made the gingerbe look natural, natural color. So these, this is in here. The teeth that we use, the denture teeth, these are Shotlander Enigma Life teeth. They are really natural looking and superb. So this is it. So you can see here, that's the stainless steel clasp here, which is quite visible there. So we're gonna now fast forward nine months. I don't want to make the denture before nine months, you know, the actual definitive dentures. So now, seeing that you're sitting at home, think about if you had a patient in, in the surgery, how, what design of denture would you give um, Joe here. So this is, it, it's going to be a metal based denture, a cobalt chrome denture. How do you do it? Just think about it. 
this is what I did. And I, I love, this is a Scandinavian design system. It's different than the RPI system that we're taught in Britain and in many parts of the world. This is a, I find it a much better system, the Scandinavian system. In other words, what we're trying to do is, first of all, keep as much of this area free. So this, all of that, the gingival margins are as free as possible. We, we use as much tooth support as possible that we can. And we've also got bracing with a lingual bar or sometimes a sublingual bar there, maximizing extension up the saddle areas and two clasps per denture is a general rule that I have. Two clasps per denture. And composite rest seats are amazing. Jim Brudvig, a prosthodontist from Seattle, um, came up with this idea years ago with these rest seats that sit on and bond onto the inside of the lower teeth. And I, I'll show you how these work. This is Joe here. So what I do is I put rubber dam over the teeth, sandblast the, with a Ronda Flex. This is a Cavo instrument. It's really good. Sandblast the fitting surface, the cingulums, and what I'm, and then I add um, etch to this, and then bond, and then blob on composite to these areas, and then zap those, light cure it, and then tidy them up with a burr. And this allows the denture to sit beautifully on those lingual surfaces. It offers support and stability. It's amazing. And uh, that you can actually see them more clearly on uh, the model here. This is the definitive cast for Joe here. So you can see these cingulum, the accentuated cingulums. They work beautifully. And then the denture itself just fits over like this. Fantastic. And fully extended up the retromolar pad. And you can see now he's had periodontal surgery, it's brushing better, you can get TPs between these teeth and all that saliva can get in there and it's helping to reduce periodontal problems later on and caries too. So if we strip away those teeth, I just wanted to show you how we fit these gold, wrought gold clasps. I love wrought gold for anterior teeth here. So that is welded to the metal work here and it's 0.9 millimeter and they grip beautifully. That's it there looking from above the metal work. This is Chris Heskus, um, chrome cobalt work. It's beautiful. He works just down the road in Chorley in Lancashire. Let's have a look at his teeth. So these are Joe's teeth in place. So the upper, I'll, let's talk about the upper first. This is the definitive, definitive denture. We, I like to, for, with definitive dentures, in combination syndrome cases, in other words, they've got natural lower teeth bashing away at the upper. I like to put a metal insert into the denture to reinforce it. So it's, it's got a metal plate and then mesh around the edge with a lovely post dam in acrylic here. And that means we can get a great seal. And also I can reline it in the future, should I need to. And then if we move over to the right hand side, we can see the lower denture here, maximum extension of the retromolar pads, beautiful support from the lower teeth, sublingual bar, gold clasps changed his life totally and utterly changed his life um, and Joe can eat anything you name it you know fish and chips and fajitas not a problem and they don't move this is what he told me so this is my protocol here this is very simply what I do when I'm doing immediate dentures and taking a patient through to definitive dentures. So at the extraction visit, I will in 60% of cases use Visca gel. 
two months later, I reline with Ufi Gel Hard Chair Side. So it's a hard acrylic reline. And then four months later, I do a lab reline by making an impression in the denture and then giving that to Rowan. And then nine to 12 months later, make definitive dentures. Very important to make that. So I don't like making immediates as a definitive. I find that there's too many things wrong with the immediate that I want to rectify. So it all comes as a package when a patient comes to see me. So, right, so I want to now just bring all of this together into a, uh, summarise it in the treatment of Wendy here. So Wendy hated the appearance of her upper four incisors, you know, with this inflammation, uneven gingival level around there. They were also chipping on the inside, deep overbite. So her, she was cracking the palatal surfaces, the palatal surfaces of the upper teeth there. And also, if you look really closely here, we've got um, crowns, heavily restored posterior dentition there, but with good bone support. Let's have a look at the x-ray. Look at those upper incisors with the these apicectomies and massive posts inside and areas on all four of those. So, you know, what are we going to do for her? Options very quickly were, do we strip them all down, redo the endos and restore with fragile masterpieces? Do we extract them and put implants in, an implant bridge? Or do we take them out and do a denture, uh, a metal-based denture? So I gave um, Wendy all those options and she went away and thought about it and then came back and we talked about it on the phone um, and discussed it and she wanted to go for the denture after discussion. So let's go through it. So let's go through these phases. So we're gonna take out these upper teeth there just in the comfort of your home, imagine she was in your chair. Well, how would you design the immediate denture? What, how, what sort of shape would you give it? So I use a classic design really for this, which is I like colleted immediate dentures so that it goes into all of the collets all the way around of the teeth. So we've got good support from the teeth. In this case, we used ball ended clasps between those premolars, and we did that because the bite was so tight in terms of getting wire across. It's also flangeless, so that's the first design. So let's go for impressions. So this is a one impression, two parts, just like I've shown you using those two different materials, like for Donna. And so I give Rowan that, that's the upper impression on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, a, low, a really good detail lower impression for the bite, and also a futile D bite in intercuspal position. So, and then Rowan mounts that model in intercuspal position and then carefully just takes the teeth away. Rather like if we were doing resin bonded crowns and had removable dies, we keep that gingival margin there, drill into it about five millimeters into the roots of the teeth there and then socket fit the immediate denture with a little bit of pink on it. You'll be able to see it in a minute. Let's have a look at the prepared model. This is what we do. We prepare the model. So we cut away five millimeters into these sockets like that. And the denture also pin dam at the back importantly, just here. And that's the denture finished with these lovely collets all the way around.
there fitting beautifully so and then that's it in place so let's have a look at it closely there so we've got a bit of pink here and a little bit of pink here and here so, and we've also got nice bullet shaped Pontex. So here we are at extraction. We've taken the teeth out. I use luxators to do this, direct to luxators, just working my way around really carefully, minimal trauma to take out the teeth. And now I, this is gold dust. This, this next top tip it is just brilliant. It's what Rowan taught me 20 years ago. And now, if you are an undergraduate or a, a, a fairly recently qualified, taking a denture just out of the packet and expecting it to fit just won't happen. It just doesn't happen. It, I always thought it should do, but it doesn't because there's so many variables. Now, I want to share with you how we get it to fit beautifully. So when I come to fit the immediate denture, I will not touch this area here this is the junction that touches the tooth i will only adjust the denture above that area so uh, it, it's a bit clearer on this next slide here so if you imagine this is an immediate denture going in place i use tons of this spray this is occlude spray i i use it all the time for my denture work spray it onto the fitting surface try it in the mouth where it rubs off i adjust it in these areas but i don't adjust this area here because if i do i'll create a gap really really important and i use a, a crown prep burr a diamond chamfer crown prep burr like that so you can see that the this is the denture fitted and if you look at all of my dentures when we come to fit they all look like this because i've adjusted below that area so there's no gaps no food getting stuck in so here it is fitted beautiful in place so this is wendy with the teeth in now wendy wanted them that shade the two lights I don't, I personally don't like them, but that's what Wendy wanted. She wanted them to match the colour of her previous crowns. So that's what we went with. So now two, let's fast forward now two months. Here she is, two months later. So we have a gap forming here where we've got resorption, everything shrinking back. So what I do is a chair side reline at this point here. So this is the um, resorption. So this is what I do at the chair side reline. I use Ufi Gel Hard. There's loads of different products on the market for doing this. Ufi Gel works absolutely fine. I block out the teeth with wax and then this stops the Ufi gel from running into the teeth, just like I was describing for Visco gel. And whilst it's setting, I take it in and out, in and out, so that it doesn't lock in. And it sometimes, and I did, I made a big mistake last year. I forgot to keep taking it in and out for this patient here. This is Diane. Diane has the same type of denture as Wendy, so it's upper two to two. And here I am, having not pulled it in and out, in and out, it's locked in. And this is me, one and a half hours later, trying to get the flipping thing out. And I've got a patient waiting, I'm really stressed. Diane's been so calm and lovely about it, but I have to cut it out. You can see I, that's the canine there, and I'm just trying to use my drill. It's a speed increasing handpiece, just with a crown prep burr on, just gently take it away. 
my face here is hot and really red because I'm stressed about this. So the message I'm trying to say is whilst it's setting, just keep taking it in and out, in and out, and it works beautifully. So this is one and a half hours later. Are we going to get it? Yes, we have. Good. So here we've got, let's go back to Wendy now. So that's that's it with the little bit of Ufi gel on here, just to fill in that gap. There, nice and thin, just restores that missing tissue. And again, she's fine for another uh, two months. So four months, so four months after extracting the teeth, you can see there's even more shrinkage of that bone. And now what I do is I get Rowan to do a lab reline. And I want to share with you this technique that I use for doing the reline. So inside the denture, I do a silicone impression in light bodied impression material and I hold it firmly up onto the palate. And then take that out. And this is a really important detail here. What I do is where the, there's a flow of material going across the collet, I trim it with a blade, a scalpel blade along here so that Rowan will not fill in that defect there. He won't fill in that space. So it will mean that the denture will fit really well. I then put this back into the mouth and do an over impression in a stock tray. So that goes back over, wait for that to set and then take it out. And it comes out like this. So really lovely um, impression. And there you can see, if you look closely, the detail, the collet's free here, very important. Rowan pours that model, makes a lovely model here of that, and then relines the denture with cold cure, Pegasus, Shotlander material. That's the model, lovely fit like this, beautiful on that front edge. And then we take this back to the mouth and that's the denture fitted at four months here with a very, you can, all, you can hardly see the flange here, it's beautiful. So that's it. So then if we, she's all fine for a while. And then if we now fast forward nine months time, We've got resorption again. You can see that gap developing between the flange and the gum. So now it's to, ready to think about our metal based denture. So I want you just to think about if they were in the chair, what type, how would you design the metal work? How would you design this definitive metal based denture? Bearing in mind, we've got heavily restored posterior teeth. This is what we did, quite a different type of design. So lots of metal occlusal surfaces, just like a stabilization splint or like a Michigan splint, almost like made of metal here with good palatal support. Two clasps as far back as possible out of sight and if you look at the lower section, a lovely path of insertion to disguise the gap between the canine and the lateral incisor and the flange there, optimizing the aesthetics. So this is going to act as a splint, protecting those heavily restored teeth and replacing those missing front teeth. So here we go, stages definitive impression in a special tray. This is dense ply blueprint, lovely, beautiful impression, lots of detail in that. And then before I make the metal work, in these cases where they are quite complex, I like to make a pattern mock up before we make the metal work for, for a few reasons. So we take this to the mouth, 
like that. So that's in the patient's mouth here. And try that in. I can check it fits. Number two, I can check the occlusion on it and make sure I've recorded the occlusion accurately. And then number three, the patient can assess it and look in the mouth and see where there's red that will be metal when we finish the denture. So I can actually say to the patient, look, this is going to be metal when we finish it. So they can have a good look at it. Here it is with the metal work finished, beautiful work. We're keeping it away from the gingival margins as much as possible. We can get TPs between those teeth even. So it's a hygienic Scandinavian design. Those overlays, the fitting surfaces, these have not been electro polished. So they fit the teeth beautifully. They are. And then where we sit against the soft tissues, that's polished and helps to reduce inflammation. So here's the denture in place. So without the denture in place on the articulator, look at the zero setting on the incisal pin. We've fit, put the denture in and we've opened the bite two millimeters on the chrome framework here like that. We check the framework in the mouth in the same way with occlude. So just to try it in, make sure it's fitting, make sure the bite's perfect. And that's it here with the chrome framework just fitting beautifully in place. This is the definitive model, the working cast. So you can see that Rowan's cut in pin dams here just for the extension of the, so we can seal it. So that just pushes into the gingiva, into the gum to seal that metal work to avoid ingress of food underneath it. We've got cobalt chromium clasps at the back there. These are nice long arms. They've got good flexibility for a grip and an anterior path of insertion. So that's the denture finished. Really thin flange. Look at the border of it. It's knife edge almost, but that's just replacing that missing tissue. All we're wanting to do is put the, the teeth back where they were naturally. Now, I want to just take you back to a very, this is a very, very important feature. She's got heavily restored teeth. I don't know how long those posterior teeth are going to last, but with this system, we can add a tooth to it. We can actually laser weld a metal tag on and add a tooth on just like this. This is a different denture for a different person. This is actually Diane, who I got the denture stuck, but she lost that tooth later. So we added the tooth on here and we added it by putting a laser welded tag on it and then a tooth can be fitted. So what I'm trying to say is that this denture is planning for the future. So you can see the tooth, the added tooth on here for Diane there. These are future proof. So we're back to Wendy now, lovely thin flange here. This is crucial for aesthetics. Lovely, it's really beautiful. So that's the finished denture there, ready to be fitted. So on the articulator, opens the bite up two millimeters. So that's it fitted in the mouth. Beautiful, plenty of uh, saliva can get into those teeth, just sitting on the occlusal surfaces. The bite spot on here. So open, bite together, lovely and even on that denture. There's no occlusion on the natural teeth at all at the top. It's just purely on the denture metal work. And this is it fitted, you know, the beautiful blended flange just there. Sorry, I know they're a bit light. I wish they were just a shade darker, but this is before and after. And here's Wendy with it finished before and after.
and completely changed her life. And you know, I fitted it and I did not need to adjust it at all. She came in for one review and that was it, job done. So now I know that the design was quite extreme for occlusal surfaces. I just want to share with you what I would do is if we're not opening the bite up, in other words, I, if I'm not concerned about those teeth cracking, then I will just make it like this. So just with these lingual surfaces there, and this is, and the, the, the dentures made in intercostal position. But this is for a case here, if those teeth are potentially going to be lost in the future through periodontal disease. But if those teeth are unrestored, the design changes quite radically. So for instance, these premolars are unrestored for this patient called Angela there and there. So there's no need for any metal work to touch them. Whereas that tooth, that six and that six, they have One's got an apisectomy and the other one's got a gold crown and who knows how long they're going to last. So we can always add a tooth onto it. But the basic principle is a chair. It's like a table leg. So we're supporting from the canines and at the back there. I now want to move on to a full lower denture, immediate lower denture. I'm going to take out Bert's lower five teeth. We've got caries and we've got periodontal disease. Let's get them out quickly. This is speeded up eight times. Take them all out super fast. I'm a quick worker. And I fit, I, what I've done is I've fitted a lower full denture and a complete upper denture here. And I'm going to take out this Optra guard now. And if your sound is working, you will hear really amazing suction on this lower full denture. It'll be that suction. So there's no implants on that. That's just purely peripheral seal. So, and then here he is, Bert, one week later, is totally solid still. And he's helping me though, you can see his tongue there. I can really push on that. So now getting this level of stability and also retention, suction, it's absolutely a tribute to Dr. Abe, who's listening today from Tokyo. And I want to say thank you, Dr. Abe, for developing this technique. It is fantastic. And if any of you are interested in achieving suction on a lower denture, I would advise you to get this book here. It's actually, these are just behind me here. Brilliant step-by-step -step process for doing that. So now, and it's all to do with the shape of the lower denture. And in particular, if you look closely where my pointer is here, that is part of the denture, which covers completely the retro molar pad. This part there, the dentures have a classic shape to them. And the way that they are designed, the cheek and the tongue rest on the lower denture and hold it in place almost like a sandbag. So, and I want to just share with you how I did it for Bert for his immediate lower denture. So this is Bert's lower primary cast. So this is a primary model that we've taken and Rowan made a special tray on that. So, and we did it in two parts. So this is part one, number one tray. And critically, this is very, very important, is the tray extends and covers the retromolar pad here. It also avoids a sinew called the semea sinew coming into the base of the retromolar pad. And it is slightly short of the width of the mandible by two millimeters, both sides. 
look in his book, it'll explain it very, very clearly. So, so this is part one of Trey. And the, the beauty about having this under tray, I've got one here, there, the beauty about this is that we can actually take the impression of the saddles without the teeth getting in the way. So just like this there. So it avoids the teeth getting in the way. Fantastic. And then Rowan makes an over tray that fits on top. So it's just like this here. You can see that two parts to it. This that one on the screen has got two different colours. You can make them the same material just like that as well. So and this is how it all fits together. It's fantastic. It really is. And so what I do is I board and mould part one tray first with green stick. And I'm actually talking about this in a webinar next week on Tuesday, a week tomorrow, um, about exactly how to do this. But I board a mould with green stick here first, doing five movements that Dr. Rabe has developed. And then I put zinc oxide in, we take it to the mouth, fit it down onto the back bit there. So this is a zinc oxide, eugenol is starting to set. And then Claire takes out the retractors. And I get him to close and I get to go e and then lick the lip. So that's number three, push against the lower front teeth with your tongue, that's four, and then swallow number five with some water. So that you notice that Claire would put a, a three and one into the mouth and squirt a bit of water in. So it's five movements, I'll repeat them. So it's e, u, lick the lip, push the lower, the front of the lower, tongue against the lower front teeth firmly and then swallow with a bit of water. So that, that's the, so that's it in the mouth there, set, ready. So now I'm going to take my over impression, fill that with alginate, push it over those lower front teeth there like that and then just let this set. And it all comes out beautifully like this. It's super cool. There we've got, it. so it's lovely. So it's all together. And then Rowan then beautifully mimics and copies that shape in the final denture. And then we get that great suction effect. So that's the lower there. And I just want to share with you now this final very short case with you. So Peter, and this is how Peter presented. He's got a really a, a big partial denture in terms of numbers of teeth. He's only got three natural teeth at the top. So premolar and canine on one side and a, a premolar on the other. So five of those upper anterior teeth are part of the denture with this ugly metal clasp. And he wanted a smile back like this. This was him um, many years before with a lovely smile and he wanted to have that back so he could then in nine months time his daughter was getting married and he was going to be doing the wedding speech and giving his daughter away in marriage so he wanted to feel really comfortable about his smile. So I'll just quickly show you this uh, process for him. So this is the partial that he had in place um, originally. So let's let's just critique this now. So these metal clasps rubbed away the buccal edges of those teeth there. So they were actually quite flat. So they've worn the enamel down. It didn't look fantastic, but in terms of let's critique the denture itself, we've got I often see dentures that underextended around the tuberosities. I like them to go all the way back there to get maximum support 
from the tuberosity. It's also a plate design, which causes permanent inflammation um, to the teeth as well. So, and there's two clasps there. Let's just have a little think in your head how you'd design it if he was in the chair now. Thinking about hygiene, you can see, look at the inflammation that's resulted from this plate design around here with the plaque building up, gingival inflammation. We want to keep it free. So, and this was the design that we came up with. So let's focus in on the design. So we've got here clear around the necks of the teeth. So this is just sitting on the teeth, this metalwork. We've also got a space between these teeth here. So I've not joined up the tooth support there. And also a composite rest seat on the canine. We've got two gold eye bars, and this is important. Now these gold eye bars are tucked back distally. They're not coming round the front of the tooth. And because we've got resistance to distalization, we can tuck them back out of sight. Very important. And also path of insertion of the denture here. So we've got, it's got an anterior path of insertion to make it look aesthetically beautiful. Um, so, and also if we look at the major connector, we've got a ring connector, but it's really well supported by the pallet all the way around here. Here, I, he had a gag reflex, that's why we kept this free and he wanted it to do that. But I think just filling that in with a plate would be perfect too and would work perfectly well. So and this is another really key part of the whole process of getting great aesthetics is using the rim and using the dentate picture. So carving the rim with reference to that dentate picture and giving Rowan and Sam, my technicians, that information. So that matrix is then something they can set the teeth up with. So matrix is the wax rim. Now, this was total curveball in terms of treating Peter. He had a fall during the treatment. Whilst we were making the upper denture, he fell at home and bashed out and cracked that lower right lateral incisor. So he came in in a panic to the surgery with it in his hand. He said, Finn, what can we do with this? Can you help me? So what we did was we made a cast nickel chromium plate that fitted onto the central incisor that was still there. And it also fitted onto a model. So this was the model that we were making in a, for the occlusion for the denture. So we made that on this with two little hooks like that. I then trimmed off the root here and did a retrograde root filling with composite to seal it off. Glued that on with panavia like that there. So that's glued on with panavia. So we've got a resin bonded bridge with the natural tooth that's going to look beautiful. So and then we then etch and fit. I, I extracted the root, sorry, extracted the root fitted the immediate um, resin bonded bridge and then sand, sanded those down, the little metal hooks that located it, sanded those off, trimmed that down. If you look at it, it's quite interesting. When we fit things that have been out of the mouth for a while, they dehydrate and go a totally different colour. But watch what happens later on when you see the end picture. It's, it just matches perfectly. Here's the upper denture in place. It extends beautifully back beyond, right over the tuberosities here. In gag reflexes, in patients who've got really pronounced gag reflexes, this is absolutely fine. 
it's the extension in this area that is critical. So we keep it further forward of, these are the fovea palatini there. We keep it further forward of that, but it's well supported all the way. And you can see that Rowan has imbricated those upper teeth using that reference of the photo from when uh, Peter had his natural teeth. So that's it here in place, done. And you can see the lovely, the gold clasps are tucked back both sides. This is the flange of the denture all the way around here. That's an artificial canine, which is a different colour to the front teeth. So it's darker, but it's to match that colour and got some movement. Also the lower tooth here, this is the RBB, the resin bonded bridge, Maryland bridge here. That's the right colour now. We've got some recession around that area where we've extracted the tooth. Here he is with it finished in place, looking really good. A little bit of wear, dead important to make things look real is make them imbricated a bit, but also little bits of chipping and wear on those incised ledges, crucial, dark canine. And this is him with it fitted and he was just thrilled with it. And this is what he said, I'm back when he looked in the mirror and he started crying. And it's not often that I get a hug off a man and he's, he's a big chap, he's six foot four. He turned around and gave me a massive hug um, and it was terrific. So, and I just want to thank you very, very much for listening. Um, and just want to let you know, if you're interested, I'm doing some further webinars. Um, each Tuesday, tomorrow, and for the next four Tuesdays. And it'd be lovely for you to join me talking about different aspects of dentures. Thank you. Thank you, Finn, for an excellent and inspiring presentation. I'm sure that all of us will have many, many tips that we can adapt to our daily work. And we have lots of questions. Okay, I have one that is clear. What are the post-operative instruction given to the patients after giving the immediate denture? Okay, the, so the post-operative instructions are really important. Um, the patient mustn't take the denture out for any length of time only take it out after eating to clean the fitting surface and rinse the mouth and then fit the denture so, and that denture must be worn for 24 7 for the first week um, but only take it out for cleaning so that's number one but the first 24 hours is critical it's very important that the patient doesn't rinse the sockets a lot. So they must not take the denture out and then go. Because they can dislodge the clots and then we can get a dry socket, which is horrendous. So first 24 hours, no rinsing, but only clean after meals and then leave it in place and i say to the patient it's gonna be really sore so and it's gonna you're gonna have the worst week of the whole process straight after so and i advise them if at all possible to have at least one week off work after they've had this done ideally take two weeks off so the, they, these are the main points, really. Is there any good source for the Scandinavian RPD design? Yes, there is. Um, it's a textbook, which... Um, you 
you can take a screenshot of that. That is good. That this book describes it in detail. This approach. Okay. Okay, when you are using the ball ending claps, aren't you afraid of this movement without occlusal stops? Uh, not really, no. I don't. Uh, I've not experienced that. But I, to be honest, we don't use ball ending claps very often. Um, it's just in. It will only be like a handful of cases that I've done it uh, over the past few years. Generally, we do raw wire occlusally approaching, but but no, I, I I can't see what why they would move. I, I'll tell you so, where the, the question comes from: the fact that we are used to place uh, raw wire as occlusal stops on the occlusion to prevent oh, yeah. the denture to. Uh, down and, and you've shown that you're doing your by the, uh, the composites which you are placing on the singular part. So yeah. we're using to do it with rot wire and the occlusion. So this is where the question comes of the teeth on the whole part. That's right. So, but if you actually look at the, I totally agree with you, Ami, with that. And the ball ended clasps, they actually did run across the occlusion. They were actually supported by the teeth. So. It's no, it's it's still supported beautifully. It's not going to sink because it's too supported in that area. We mostly use cost of three line for immediate denture insertion. What is the advantage to use a visco gel, and how long the visco gel stay before lab reline? So, so what's I don't know what this first material is that you mentioned. Visco gel is a uh, relining a clear relining material. Yes, I use that, um, and it's so the visco the visco gel that will last for. I usually Three leave months. it in Three months, for two yeah. months. Three months. That's what the company says, and it's true. It is. Yeah. It's a lot. So the visco gel is fine for, for that length of time, for two to three months. It's absolutely fine. Like Amy mentioned, there was a, Limor, when you asked the question, there was a material at the beginning. Cosoft, GC Cosoft. Oh, GC yeah, yeah, Cosoft. Sorry, it's my... <laughs> my uh, my it's, accent. Cosoft is great as well. <laughs> So I'd be happy to use Cosoft too. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, thank you. This is very useful. My question is when you cover the occlusal surfaces, is it done at an increased vertical dimension at how many millimeter ideally? Um, so, so in in the case that I showed, which was Wendy, we opened the bite on the incisal pin. So, um, you know, on the articulator, where there's an incisal pin here. So we opened it up by two millimeters on the incisal pin. Um, that was that was to give us enough thickness of metal on the back teeth so that it's not going to wear through so it would be around about 0.5 of a millimeter of material on the occlusal surfaces of the posterior teeth but we in terms of like you it doesn't there's really there's a, some very good studies showing that opening the part patients can tolerate that without any problems at all not a problem. Next, uh, with that chrome case, with the chrome denture, where you did a design to overlap the teeth, 
and the occlusion was open <laughs> the same. Uh, by two millimeter order to do this, is it imperative that all teeth are opposing contacting <clears throat> on the denture? Otherwise, this can lead to over eruption. How yes. is the change in the bite tolerated for how long? So, yeah, it's, it's important that the opposing teeth touch the denture. If, they, if the opposing teeth don't, don't touch, don't include on the denture, then we'll get over eruption of that tooth. So, um, so that will be, um, so it's important to, to do that. The second part of the question is, how long will it last? Um, I, I don't know. I think that the denture will last a long time. I think also because it's metal, polished metal, including onto restored lower teeth or natural lower teeth. I just think it, it's a, it's a long-term proposition, but who knows how long is a piece of string? I don't know. Okay, how do you make the occlusal adjustment on the metal occlusal surface of the RPD that you fabricated with the metal occlusal class? Um, I didn't adjust the occlusal surface. So when we fitted it, the occlusion was perfect. And this is, this is why it's really important to make the mock-up of it, which is beforehand, we make one with, with Duralay, and then we can then try that in the mouth. If the occlusion is not right on that, we adjust it and take a new registration, and then the chrome is made uh, with that new registration, eliminating bite problems. Very important. The mock-up is, I think, really important. I, I, I would like to elaborate more on this or to ask you some more. Um, what kind of an excursion movements are you doing when you are giving a patient to bite on from cobalt? Meaning, like when there is a kind of a excursion to the right or to the left. Is the chrome cobalt still in contact or do you do some composite protection to prevent from grinding of the uh, uh, opposite jaw against the metal? So we, we try to essentially, I mean, what we're trying to do is just to keep all of the, all of the excursion from the metal work. So we give the patient quite simply canine guidance on that. But the canine is on metal? Yes. No, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not arguing with the, with the idea, but I question, as a, as, an, as a question, not question you, question the, the, uh, the grinding of the oppos opposing canines due to the fact that they are touching uh, chrome cobalt. Right. Aren't you uh, afraid of that? Um, I'm not particularly, but I, to be honest, Danny, I'm, that is something that I need to look in the literature and, and check to see, because there's some, I think there's been some really good research showing occlusal wear with gold on natural teeth and then porcelain on natural teeth, and et cetera. And I'm, I'm not actually um, au fait with the literature. So, but uh, in practice, uh, this is something that I do quite regularly, and I don't, I don't feel it's a, a problem in the long term. But I might, I, I don't have all the answers at all. So I know, I'm asking because, knows better. I'm asking because uh, it's a question whether to leave uh, the uh, Canon guidance or Canon rise against such a heavy metal. Uh, against teeth because we after years we see that the opposing teeth are getting you know crushed not crushed but grinded to uh, grounded to the to the, to the right. basis my, my own sort of uh, you know uh, one when i was uh, when i was doing my um, many years ago 
there was a really experienced dentist called Michael Wise. Um, he was probably one of the best um, uh, British uh, orthodontists that we've ever had. And he wrote this book here. So, um, and it's actually my most heavily read book. It's Management of the Failing Dentition. Um, and it, it likewise, is just a total mentalist for literature and for materials. And he was, he felt that polished surfaces, when it was highly polished and was not rough, was the least uh, damaging to the opposing teeth. So he, has a paper in this, he has a paper in this, uh, in this subject, but also, but when we see, when you look, there are uh, papers by Johnson and uh, I think, and, and other, I think if you go even to Smith and Knight and to see the, uh, um, you will see that uh, running against metal is, uh, is a hazard. And okay. such metal, base metal in particular. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you use custom tray and how do you establish the vertical dimension? So do I use custom tray? Trays. Yeah. So is that like special trays? Yes. So. Um, so for it, like, so if I was making a, a chrome denture for this person, then that would be my custom tray for them. So it's a light cure base material and, uh, you know, close fitting on the posterior and nice spacing around the anterior with holes in it. So, but yeah, so use loads of these, dead important for getting beautiful extensions posteriorly. Um, what's the other part of the question? How do you, how do you establish the new vertical dimensions? So, I, I just opened them up so that we've got enough material there that's not going to get worn so that the we've got so it's not going to wear through the metal so it's not too thin so we just open them up so we've got at least 0.4 of a millimeter thickness over the teeth and then so that it's whatever that causes in terms of that increasing vertical Would you do the visco gel reline after doing your light body silicone technique to find the area that may be rubbing? Uh, yes. So the silicone impression wash, the fit check, I do that first and then do, this, do the um, visco gel later. Um. More, more visco gel question. When do we apply visco gel, and is it in the same insertion day? So, the, yes. So, uh, the visco gel is placed when we extract the teeth. So, and um, the important. Why do we use it, or when do we use it? I use it if i feel that the denture is lacking a bit of retention and i want it to fit better if i feel that there's a space where the sockets are so in, in about 40 percent of cases i won't use it and about 60 percent i do how do we work with patients with a huge gag reflex um so Working with a, a patient with a huge gag reflex, that is that takes it's a number of steps. So first of all, number one is managing that patient carefully. And so talking them through, make sure they're sitting up, not lying back, 
this is for like having impressions done, for taking impressions. So I'll sit upright, rehearse it. So I'll do a dry run first, tell them exactly what you're going to do and describe it in detail. You get the nurse to do what they do, try the train, talk them through it. Talk to the patient and say, I'm going to set it up at the back first, rotate it up forward, meditation or breathing through your belly, through the nose. And, uh, and then whilst we're doing the impression, beforehand, we'll ask the patient, do you mind or would you like Claire to hold your hand whilst we're doing it? So if the patient wants, they can hold the patient's hand and this human to human contact, it's, it actually enables the person to cope better with this stressful situation and they often are absolutely fine with it. And then the, the other really important thing is have a clock with a timer showing how long it's got to set the impression material and then we can count it down. It's a bit like doing press-ups and we have, you know, you've got 10 seconds to go, push it out. So it's actually helping that person. Uh, so that's another thing. So that generally works, all of those things. But occasionally I'll use acupuncture just by using my thumb, pressing firmly on the mentalis groove here in the middle, just press that there. And that just helps to, and then very occasionally I use an acupuncture needle which you can just push into the this area here and also the tragus of the ears and that works also so so that's it's, that's what i do and we we don't find it a problem and also the other thing the loading of the tray we've got too much in the back is important too so it's back first rotate yeah, I can give one more tip that worked for me. You know, everybody has some his tip. So yeah. first of all, to relax. You have to relax. And I give the patient a stress ball. A stress ball. So basically to distract their concentration uh, to something else than from the gun. And it works. <laughs> Usually. I have one, one idea, which was uh, one of my teachers told, told me that to go on the geographic uh, maneuver. You know what does it mean? The geographic maneuver. To refer the patient. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have uh, Finn to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Okay, that's uh, when you use a visco gel, how do you handle the material that flow into the socket? So it just, yeah, where it goes into the socket, so it goes like little spikes there. So I just cut it with a blade. By the yes. way, Finn, I, I sent you, I sent you a picture of the visco gel in your mail, so you can see the the pen. Oh, thank you. That's great. Yeah, so yeah, I just trim it. Uh, another really very important practical detail with the visco gel as well is I mix it up really thick. So I don't do it according to the manufacturer's instructions. It's very, very viscous, very thick, and then put it in and, it's, and then just work with it just like an impression material. Yeah, so what you can do, I mean, I believe you have to use the same amount of powder liquid as the uh, manufacturer suggests, but you can wait longer, no? Yes, you can do. Yeah. Can you, put a gauze? yeah. can you put a gauze or something above the socket or it will make the visco gel too rough? And... Um, I think that's, it's not necessary really. I don't find... Um, I don't think we need to pack the sockets with anything. It does creep up, but it's it's not a big yeah. deal. Um, 
it's not a big problem. And secondly, um, also sometimes that if I've taken out multiple teeth, then some of the uh, interdental embrasures gape open, so the soft tissues like that. So I will put a suture into proximally just to hold it. Now, if I'm using Viscogel in those circumstances, I put some Vaseline onto the suture just to stop the Viscogel from going around the suture and I'm trying to rip it out. So that's another little practical detail. Does Viscogel have the same uh, stages like the uh, Cosoft has? Yes, I think so. It's, it's a number of years ago since I used CoSoft, but I do think it works just absolutely fine as well. And I think it is similar in terms of it. I think the Visco gel is a little bit softer initially. That's my own thoughts, but it's fine. Um, with the composite addition lingual to the lowers, Will this not wear with the metal resins, causing poor retention? No, this is, a, this is a common question I get asked is, do they stay on? Do they not come off? And I've been using this technique for eight years and I've had to replace one so far. Um, and I believe that because the, the metal work is so it's so extensive around the back of the teeth and it fits it not only is it fitting onto the um it's not only is it fitting onto the composite it fits onto all of the teeth so the in reality the, the denture itself is not loaded so in other words i mean the composite is not loaded particularly heavily so uh, so they don't come off um, particularly if you do it carefully with sandblasting and etching and bonding. Um, however, to put it, to actually refit one, which I've had to do once, was really easy. It was on an upper canine and I just sandblasted the canine. I put some Vaseline on the, a little tiny bit of Vaseline on the cingulum, on the fitting surface of the denture and put the composite on, press that in place, let it set it and then took it out. So the denture was acting as a matrix. So I want to take it out, zap the composite properly and then using occlude on the fitting surface into the mouth, out and where it rubs off on the composite I just sand reduced it a little bit until that was fitting properly the framework the denture which wax do you use to block out the teeth when relining the wax to block out the teeth for doing the yeah. reline um that um it's just pink wax that i just very just straightforward pink wax like a strip they come in stri those boxes and it's 1.5 millimeters it's the stuff that Rowan has for doing wax blocks, you know, like it's the same material as making a wax ren with, quite simply. So I just warm it up, peel it off and press it, press it onto the labial surface of the teeth. Oh, one of my tooth dropped off, that's the wax trying, but um, there. So yeah, it's just normal. Any wax would do. And also, you could use putty, silicone putty, as well. Just mix that up, push it in. Works really. It works a treat. Uh, do you send clinical photographs to the lab? Absolutely, T loads of them. So <laughs> yeah, lots and lots and lots. It's essential for getting good aesthetics. What trademark of teeth do you use? Greeting from Peru. <laughs> um, the teeth I use are 
They're called Shot Lander Enigma Life. The Enigma Life, uh, and the firm is Shot Lander. They're a British company, and we we developed these. I helped them develop them. Uh, they came to market in 2014. They look really good. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, there's a question about what if the teeth are over erupted and intercostal position is not reproducible with a limited amount of teeth? That's a very good question. Um, so if um, when we're when we're making an immediate denture, sometimes the teeth are in lots of different divergent positions, and also they can be mobile as well when we take the impression. So the impression that we have of the teeth may be displaced. So locating the models together in intercuspal position can be difficult. So Rowan and I, we look at the models and the way they fit, and we will grind off the teeth that look like this new to enable us to get the best intercuspal position that we can. Also with the same person, also with the coll collated design, won't that exacerbate the periodontitis? Shouldn't they be four millimeter free of gingiva? That's a very that's a, that's a very perceptive question, and the answer is, I wish they were, but we've got to wait to make the chrome denture, and acrylic is not strong enough to make it in that in the way that we would do for the Scandinavian approach. So this is this is a temporary measure for that interim. And it's a necessary evil. We could, however, just go straight away and make a chrome at the beginning, but we would then need to remake that later. So I think um, it's just from an economic perspective and an ease of <laughs> the whole thing is we can't do uh, a, a chrome immediate very easily so that's why i do the acrylic uh, first but the colleted design is more stable like that even though it is increasing the inflammation it's increasing the potential for periodontal disease and caries yes but that's why we must move on to a hygienic design later on um great lecture um, do you remove the chair side reline uh, material before doing your lab based uh, reline? No, no, I let Rowan do that. <laughs> I, I just make the impression in the, in the UFI gel and the reline stuff because it fits so well, and grinding it all away is just a faff. So I take a really good impression in the the old stuff, and then Rowan pours that model, takes the denture off, grinds it all away, and starts again. Somebody wants you to recommend a textbook for intermediate prosthodontists. So, as in immediate dentures or intermediate. Is that middle of the intermediate the intermediate prosthodontists? Not yeah. like not specialist prosthodontist, somebody that is a general practitioner or a yeah. student. Okay. Do, do. do you know is it, that's a very good question? Um the, do you know I this is very old now. I, love, I thought that was a really good book. Um, that one is, and it's really quite straightforward and simple. So I'd go for that. But the other, in, 
I'm, I'm just talking from a British perspective. There's the BDJ, the British Dental Journal, have like a series of short, smaller books on different things. So I think that's useful. Um, but, um, I'm actually, but now we're in lockdown, I'm writing a book as well. So I want to do one that's a very clear manual of partial dentures complete dentures and immediates as well with how to do it like a Haynes manual so but sorry I'm that's I'm walking in. uh is the the pre-metal framework try in for Wendy made with wax or acrylic the pre-metal try is that was it the red one I think yes, yes. yeah so it's actually made of the base is made of Durale or uh, GC pattern resin so it's an acrylic and then the teeth themselves are embedded into wax like this so this is one that I've already done for a patient here and then I have this is his metal this is a the actual framework itself that we've yet to try in. So it's so it's pattern resin rocks and see. Uh, um in the case <clears throat> just a second, it's like three parts, three. Uh as the cruiser source for being you cover the occlusal surface with metal. Um, will this not interfere with the bite? Uh, yes, it will. It will interfere with the bite if it's not made like a stabilization splint. So it's got to be done carefully. Um, <clears throat> Won't the patient have a problem in showing that the natural teeth don't occlude? Yes, they because would. there is a disocclusion. Yeah, absolutely. If they weren't able to get approximating touch, then they wouldn't be able to chew. But they can do with this. So there was a there was a good positive occlusion. So that was just not not a problem for Wendy at all. Uh, when you increase in two millimeter the bite, does patient mind it? Uh, do you prep the posterior teeth for the metal framework to set, uh, to set properly? If not, then how do you explain it to the patient? So, um, so first number one, patients tolerate an increase in vertical dimension um, on their natural dentition perfectly and there's absolutely loads of research out there that show increasing the patient's vertical is not a problem and um, so and they get they can manage with it beautifully um, so so that's number one uh, number two I don't prepare the teeth I do I might when I'm making partial ventures, though, this is important. I do a lot of little bits of odontoplasty, so reshaping, sometimes adding a composite to allow a clasp to retain the dental better. So I'm always looking at things. We look, use a surveyor all the time in the lab. So, but in terms of, if you remember, Wendy and her teeth, the posterior teeth, they're quite old teeth, they're flat, they've been smoothed by her occluding and grinding on, so I didn't need to do any occlusal adjustment on those to allow the framework to fit, so, so no I didn't need to do that. Um, and then there was, a, there was a third part to the question which I have not answered I don't think. Uh, somebody has two questions. Uh, what is your preferred occlusal scheme with complete dent dentures? Lingualized occlusion or fully anatomical? Let's start with this one. 
Okay, I prefer anatomical, fully anatomical over lingualized occlusion because um, anatomical occlusion looks better. The teeth, the actual aesthetics of the posterior teeth can be arranged like a natural setup. Whereas with lingualized, we've got to tilt the posterior teeth out so that the palatal crust is acting like a pestle and mortar and it just doesn't look good but it functions beautifully and I did my PhD on this I did a randomized trial comparing um, lingualized occlusion, anatomic teeth and flat posterior teeth and we found that lingualized and anatomic arrangements worked perfectly with both and we're significantly better than flat posterior teeth. Do you do altered cast technique impressions or function or function impression post processing? Yes, I do occasionally. So, um, and it's generally I find it if I'm doing a a lower free and saddle partial denture. Occasionally, when I come to fit it, the saddle itself is not fitting properly onto the soft tissues. So, in those circumstances, I will do a wash impression and I'll do that impression in zinc oxide, and then Rowan will reline the saddle. So, that is if it doesn't fit at the beginning, you know, when I fit it. The way that I do my definitive impression though is quite important is the definitive impression of the saddle areas I use green stick on the fitting surface of the posterior as well as on the buccal edges to try and get some pressure of the tissues during the impression making. So it's it's a little bit like an altered cast technique with it isn't because we can't do the altered cast technique as it truly was described because it was different viscosities of wax just to actually take these impressions and these waxes are not available and actually I don't think it's that important anyway so personally <laughs> In candy class two, how do the distally engaging clasps disengage the tooth when the patient is biting on the distal uh, end saddle? So it doesn't. So that's the. This is the thing about. So the the RPI system is to it is where you've got a mesial rest, distal guide surface, and eye bar, and that is designed to allow the pivoting into the saddles of the saddle of the free end saddle and and help help that eye bar to disengage now i don't like the rpi system i think it's not very good sure. <laughs> so and this is why I've adopted the um, Scandinavian approach is that once they've got lots of tooth support from the metalwork here anteriorly, when we press on this saddle area, because there's so much tooth support, there's no pivoting into the saddle areas. Yeah. If, it, if anyone's watching now still, then I'm doing my webinars tomorrow, they're just purely on partial ventures, not not on um, immediate so I'll be talking more about why I don't like the RPI system okay good okay yeah I'll make my student also listen to it <laughs> uh, a question from Toronto thank you for such a wonderful presentation I have seen anyone who talked about removable prostodontics with such passion my question is a simple one do you apply adhesive to your trays prior to impression taken i'm also not familiar with the materials you have used are they chemically uh, two different materials 
uh, that naturally bond to one another. So, thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, the so uh, I use adhesive. So it say the, the technique that I showed you was zinc oxide on the saddles here, and then over the top here was alginate. So first of all, zinc oxide eugenol it sticks to dry tray material like that. So there's no adhesive with zinc oxide eugenol. So the alginate it, it's got perforations. And also I use an adhesive, which is specific for the alginate. So it's an alginate adhesive on there. So it's specifically for alginate. Um, when I go into the mouth and do that together, then I don't normally have any adhesive on here to, to allow the alginate to glue. It, because the alginate almost locks around the whole thing, it just comes out together. Um, so and I don't find there's a problem with the dissimilar material, but it's very important that it is caused by the technician quickly. How would you deal with the patient needing full upper clearance? But at the molar area, the tuberosity are very bulbous and on, adjust, and on adjustment ended up with loose denture after a few review visits. As the posterior area of the denture just kept causing discomfort to the patient. I have. Here, this is like a case with massive tuberosities there. So it's really important for Rowan to adjust. So what we do, Rowan adjusts the inside here to allow it to fit over the tuberosities and without it scraping the edge. But if it's painful, when I come to fit it, then I would squirt silicone in here and do a fit check in the same way that we talked about just before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What is the point of the composite seats? So the point of the composite seats are to, to help hold the denture in place. So like on that, um, if you look on the singulum surfaces, there, there's like little divots, dimples. Now they act like climbing wall holes, you know, like so, and it's only just a little bit, but it helps to support the denture, stop it from sinking, so support, and also stability it helps the denture stop crystallizing too. So it's those two things, and they are amazing. Uh, do you give uh, anesthesia before taking impression for the uh, very mobile teeth at risk of being pulled out um, during the impression? And if they do come out, how do you deal with this? Um, well, this is really important. Um, I've not ever, and this is, and I, you know, touch wood, I've not ever extracted tooth in an impression so far. And that's and because I use these techniques to prevent that from happening, which I described today. Um, I did have one patient that came to me from Boston in America for treatment and she had a this massive loose bridge that was like hanging off and so I, that's the only person that I've given local anaesthetic before doing the impression and I told her that we're going to extract some teeth with this 
but we fitted her with a denture the following day and she was happy to go without teeth for that overnight period. So, so that's the only person I could just think of was Christina. Uh, in the case of the Crohn denture covering the teeth, did you take the occlusal record in septic relation as you were opening the light? No, actually, no, I didn't do. Um, we did, we just we had her in intercuspal position, and then we just opened the articulator up on that. That's how we did it. Um, in sometimes I've got other cases that I have used a gothic arch tracing to get centric relation for an overlay denture. Um, so, and I'm showing her tomorrow. But in this case, to be honest, I don't know why we did it like in intercuspal position. Um, I can't remember it. So it's a few years ago now, but it, but it worked. You know, in terms of the occlusion, was absolutely fine. I think that's it for today. I think we we did very well. You did excellent. Thank you. And everybody enjoyed the presentation. Excellent. That's lovely. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. It was a great experience for us and yeah. ICP. Much thank appreciated. You. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks so much. Happy Easter. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah.